I was going to tell us about optical band gap energies of heterogeneous catalysts and supports. <laughs> It'll start again, I'm sure. Do I move it back a little and blow it up a bit as long as you're fiddling with it? <laughs> as long as you're into taking risk? Yes. Um, I promise to, to compress my uh, talk so as to get us back on the schedule, but I will not sacrifice time uh, for two personal statements. Uh, one of which comes from Michel Boudar, who wishes to express to the CEO his regret and to this audience's regret for not being here, and uh, to convey his appreciation for the CEO's work. Um, I will not be able to capture the elegance of Michel's actual statement, but translating loosely, he uh, wishes to, to point out that theories come and theories go, but there's a certain intransient value to good kinetics. <laughs> it's that which he wishes to add. From my own uh, experiences, I, I, I note that, as recalling how I got to CO, and it seems to me that, that long before I was, I was actually introduced to, to CO, um, I had been introduced to him through a long series of students. Uh, those who came to Stanford as, as graduate students, some of my first students at, at Delaware, and of course at Yale University, I was um, seeing CO preceded by a, a wonderful series of uh, students. Uh, all of whom either showed a mastery over the fundamentals of chemical engineering or a strong predilection for chemists. And the sum of the two uh, skills was certainly, surely constant, and I attribute both of these to the CEO. What I want to talk about today is a subject which is loosely derived from, or loosely attributed to, to work the CEO has done. It does, however, uh, bring together the two institutions uh, which figure into CEO's present and past. Some of his work was done at Yale University, and some of it was done at the University of Paris, where he currently sits. Um, I want to describe a technique which can be used to study uh, transient behavior uh, of catalyst systems, but in a particular way and, and uh, in a particular size regime, which is difficult to obtain by other techniques. So if you think about the techniques we've got available for measuring properties of catalysts in situ, then um, very, very small, sorry, very, very large particles, um, X-ray diffraction works just great, but there's a cutoff below which you have a difficult time to, to see the particles. For the smaller particles, um, then again, one can use X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, but that stops at about one nanometer when suddenly you have a uh, filled nearest coordination sphere. It's in this intermediate size range between roughly one and three nanometers where we do not have general techniques for measuring particle sizes measuring local geometries uh, in situ. Of course, there are specialized techniques in certain instances, uh, but we don't have a general one. I will introduce now one which is not completely general, like excess, for example, but uh, does have a certain generality and does convey information that you can use, that you can uh, get from measurements done in situ. It has to do with uh, using visible spectroscopy, a technique which is long known in catalysis, but now instead of looking at peak positions, which is how this technique has typically been used in the past to try to distinguish between octahedral or tetrahedral geometries, for which it doesn't work well. Instead, we're going to look at the physics of the, act of the visible absorption and to monitor much as George Holston was looking at the edge position, the onset energy at which the um, UV visible spectrum begins. And what you find, what's been known for, for many years, um, is that this edge energy moves to higher, sorry, the edge moves to higher energy as the particles get smaller. It's systematic, it's universal, it works. So therefore, in principle, one could back out of such a spectrum from the position of the edge. Here it doesn't look like there's a well-defined edge, but I'll show you how to extract that in just a second. The large particles at edge of low energy, this, um, okay, so this, is, this is done in the usual way that um, a municipal spectroscopist uh, plot their spectrum, of course, backwards. Uh, energy increases in this direction, so therefore the large particles of energy, which are low, and the small particles of energy, which are, which are large. Plot these things in sensible things. Um, so, in principle, one can get out of that edge ship some information about particle sizes. Um, if you do a very simple transformation of this edge, um, provided this what the you know, solid state physicists call direct band gap transition, it's an indirect band gap transition, there's a slightly different formula. But, but there it is at the top the um, absorption coefficient is proportional to the square root of the. Energy. Um, 
captured through normalized correctly. And you see you take these spectra and replot them according to uh, what's gone up there. And you do get much more linearized versions of the edge, and therefore it's easier to find the foot of this edge, which people typically use as the measure of the position of the edge. And now what you find is that um, here for a different series of examples, where the uh, palladium oxide particle size is known from X-ray diffraction, uh, then there's a good tracking of the particle size with edge energy, the smaller particles moving to higher energies, as I suggested. Uh, now, that would be very useful, provided you had, as George was obliged to have, um, or at least to think about having, uh, standard compounds or standard size ranges uh, for, for calibrating the, the curve that you might want to run through there. And that's certainly available, certainly possible, with a, and you can try to do things ex situ and compare them back to the spectroscopy, which you also do ex situ, um, just to calibrate the curves. And that's, in fact, been done. But what we're talking about in just a moment is a way to try to get this curve sort of in an absolute sense, not having to have calibration standards available. Um, the curve that, that runs through these data most accurately nowadays, and that comes from work that done at DuPont, where this uh, hyperbolic band gap model is this, this curve here. And it says that the, the change in energy from, uh, from some large particle, which has got the bulk band gap energy, because that's exactly what's measuring here, is the energy uh, from going from the, the highest occupied to the lowest unoccupied level is the band gap energy. But that um, energy for a particle differs from the band gap energy by such a formula which takes into account the particle size, that's D, the band gap energy itself, and something called the effective mass of the electrons or the charge transferring things that are running around. And that turns out to be our adjustable parameter for changing the shape of this, this curve. So the bulk band gap energies are, are widely available for lots of compounds and ought not be played with, although it could be played with. Now, um, before we, we go over to, to trying to get at uh, this curve in some absolute sense, let me show you another cute correlation that can be obtained from uh, measurements of this edge energy. Of course, you can measure this edge energy for particles that uh, are very large and particles which are very small, in fact, down to the cluster limit. And uh, that's been done frequently in the past. Um, about a year and a half ago, I made the following correlation. If you took a series of molybdenum oxide cluster compounds, then not using this hyperbolic band gap theory, but simply straightforward brute force um, correlation that if you look at the size of the cluster defined as the number of next nearest neighbors, because for clusters it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about diameter, you can get to measure the size of the box out of which this electron is, is running around which is doing the transition from the home to the moon. Uh, you can get a measure of the size of that box by counting the number of next nearest neighbors. If you do that, then you find a very nice correlation between the edge energy and this size of the box for this range of aluminum compounds. Um, with data supplied, Gary Halloran, who we're referring to it in a moment as well, you can do exactly the same kind of correlation for vanadium oxide clusters. And again, therefore, you've got a measure of getting excess like data, nearest um, uh, number of next nearest neighbors, by doing this uh, spectroscopy that, that only requires a $10,000 spectrometer and a $10,000 cell. Um, expensive, but not as expensive as the same. The, it is just a correlation, um, and there's no Real reason, I, I, don't, and I don't get to understand why it works. I believe it does work here. Two instances of where one gets a linear correlation between the number of next nearest neighbors and the edge energy. And Enrique and Iglesias has done exactly the same thing for, for tungsten oxides and finds a very similar correlation. In fact, the slope of all these curves is exactly the same for reasons I also don't understand. Um, but it's useful, and therefore I can offer to you as a way to characterize um, metal oxide cluster sizes uh, in size ranges where Keith Hall is, is familiar with it. Is of putting down the clusters on aluminum oxide. All right, back to measuring larger particles. Um, again, what we would like to be able to do is to find all the parameters in that equation, which I uh, put at the top again, bulk band gap energies are readily available. It's this effective mass that, that serves as the adjustable parameter that we need to be able to estimate. I remind you what this effective mass is. If you do a band structure calculation, um, or if you can measure it by by various techniques from solid state physics, what you're actually measuring is the curvature of one of these bands, um, presuming you're measuring the band which contains the highest occupied uh, level. Uh, if that band is, is very flat, which is to say that there's no dispersion, that you've got an electron which is running freely around this thing, 
Um, then, as you would expect, sort of, sort of like in the metal, um, the electron ought to have the effective mass of a free electron. On the other hand, if the electrons are very localized, then what you find is these, these bands become very tightly curved. But that's what's keeping the electrons in place. Um, then, in, in those cases, you can expect that the effective mass is going to be very large. It takes a lot of energy to make the electron move, which say it's got a lot of mass. A lot of mental so what we want to do is to get a measure of the band curvature. And again, you can do that uh, from calculation or from some, uh, so, some sophisticated experiments. But what do you do in general? What do you do when you just want to estimate whether the spectroscopy is going to be useful to you in order to characterize particles or what do you want to do if you just happen to do a counter spectrum or you want to estimate from them particle size you don't have available the effective mass measurements um, that you do have available the band measurements. Then, in those cases, um, at least in, in one of those cases, you can go over to a correlation that I discovered in this marvelous little book by Walter Harrison. Um, he goes through a couple of arguments to suggest that you can actually estimate well the curvature of these bands, the effective mass of electron, an extraordinarily simple uh, correlation, um, particularly uh, only in the case of, of narrow band gap semiconductors. Semiconductors are wide band gap, or if they're insular, they're silica, aluminum then this uh, correlation is going to fail. But in the case of narrow band gap semiconductors, then there is a wonderful uh, way to estimate rather accurately the effective mass of the electron mobilized by the mass spectrum itself. The thing in parentheses is, is uh, Harrison's correlation. It includes only the actual mass of the electron, the lattice distance for the substance that you're measuring, and the band gap energy. And from that, from Harrison's arguments, I think, um, you can estimate what he calls something on the order of magnitude of band gap energy. I uh, simply took that correlation and added a parameter, there's got to be a free parameter here, um, and then tried to back out that parameter by looking at what is the effective mass required to fit the curvature of those uh, previous calibration curves. Um, and what I found, I think rather surprisingly, is that this, this adjustable parameter equals six for a large number of, of narrow band gap semiconductors. And therefore, I offer it to you as a way of, of getting at, in some now semi-empirical fashion, uh, the, the curvature of this calibration curve if you use C equals to 6, then using Harrison's uh, correlation, which requires that you know the bulk band gap energy and the bulk lattice distance averaged in some way if it's, if it's not a, a very symmetrical crystal, um, just taking the average of the human cell size. Then you can get at uh, all the information you need in order to predict what would be the band, what would be this, this particle size versus band gap energy curve. The one up here is, is done for ruthenium sulfide because uh, some colleagues at the University of Paris were interested in doing exactly the same kind of work with small particles of ruthenium sulfide, putting in zeolites to, to try to capture the, to try to uh, confer upon them some special properties as much as was done previously of capturing them some of the sizes. Right, that's the idea. Uh, how to use it? in experimental applications, and I give you two. Um, the first one has to do with estimating particle sizes of palladium oxide, um, which have been used or are about to be used as, as um, methane oxidation in catalysts. And I showed you an example on the early slide of, of estimating particle sizes of palladium oxide supported on MGO, on silicon, and aluminum. And here are additional data that come from laboratory professor Lisa Pepperly at Yale. Um, the curve is what I showed you previously, and the curve is what um, actually fits well through the um, palladium oxide uh, cluster sizes uh, for a variety of samples. Very, very low loading, something else is happening, and I'm not going to worry about it. But what Professor Preferly, uh, our student Maxim Wolski, found was that there was a, a set of uh, particles whose smallest we could, uh, were able to compare uh, samples that sort of butt up against this curve. But there was a large number. There were a large number of samples um, which didn't fit well this correlation at all. It was as if they had a particle size measured by extra diffraction that varied strongly over a wide range, but all with exactly the same band gap energy. Um, and the question is, has such a thing, uh, such a correlation failed, or is something else going on? In fact, completely something else is going on. The something else is that these particles are not spherical. These particles have flat crystal habit. Um, they wet the surface of the aluminum on which they're sitting. 
and therefore we have, in fact, our two distinct dis distances, two distinct characteristic size of these particles. X-ray diffraction is measuring one, and the visible spectroscopy is measuring the small of the two. Um, and such, therefore, with the, with the combination of these techniques, one gets the morphology of the particles, and the sizes in two different directions. And that's rather cute. Of course, in principle, you can get exactly the same information from X-ray diffraction, but it's harder to do the X-ray diffraction in situ. However, if you want to get the morphology, that's what you're obliged to do. The idea here is to try to find these particles under reaction conditions, and these are not yet done there, but they will be in the very near future. The second uh, example, um, again, has to do with uh, using oxides as the catalyst, and now I, I want to introduce a, an interesting support effect. Suppose that you were to take a semiconducting support, um, something like uh, zirconia or anatase, and make the support particles, make, use that as the support, and make those particles very small. And now support on that some other semiconductor. Then what you might expect to happen is when you, were, if you're able to adjust the band gap energy of these now smaller particles of the support to just match the uh, band gap energy, the things supported on them, then some resonance would occur, and you would have interesting chemical properties. That's the idea behind um, this graph. The two curves over on the right for the zinc oxide and the GiO2 are ones that um, were constructed by means of this, this correlation um, that I described a, bit a while ago. And sitting here are the band gap energies that were used, in fact, on the previous plot, um, the positions at the edge of the previous plot that showed the correlation between the number of next nearest neighbors of vanadium and the, the band gap energy. So for the smallest clusters of uh, vanadium, some tetrahedral coordinated cluster, it sits here, and for these vanadium dimers, as you find this infinite change of one of the vanadium uh, compounds, then they sit there, and what intro wax has shown is that uh, on the case of uh, CNO and also anatase, at very low loading, he knows from Raman spectroscopy that these things are isolated. So we're looking, therefore, at those kinds of species on the support. Ah, then, if you make this, the particles of the anatase or the ZNO um, smaller, at some instance, you may well match the two band gap energies and something magical should occur. Um, and something interesting does happen here in Israel's data, um, where he's measured the particle size by means of the surface area. And I've tried to reconfigure that surface area, assuming that the surfaces, the certain particles were all spherical. Uh, then you can extract an effective diameter. And what you find is that as the effective diameter decreases, then the turnover frequency for methanol oxidation catalyzed by this assembly of small, isolated vanadium species on smaller and smaller particles, but that uh, turnover frequency changes rather rapidly in just about the right range over which the particle size is changing. Um, I don't, I don't uh, claim this is, this is the explanation for the data, but it's consistent with um, the idea that the particle sizes are, the particle size the support, in fact, is affecting the properties of the catalyst supported on them. Um, and if that were the case, then we would have a new kind of support effect, one which depends upon the particle size. You could imagine uses of that kind of particle size effect, for example, in photochemistry, where you're trying to uh, tune the, the optical properties of the material so as to capture effectively an incoming photon and use as energy as, as you wish. Um, and this is a way to do so where you've got this rather large absorber of support, which might therefore transfer the energy up to this uh, supported species if you had the right uh, energetics. Um, these are places that, were, that I'm taking uh, these studies. Uh, in principle, we want to be able to calculate the spectra, at least of the small, well-defined clusters that should be used in this next nearest neighbor energy correlation. And that should be doable. I haven't quite uh, figured out yet. If you did the, um, if you characterize the, the edge energies accurately, then in principle, again, something the way that George was pursuing, you might actually be able to back out from the shape of the, the curves. Um, something about a particle size distribution of, this, of the, of the uh, small particles. Um, you would have to have extraordinarily good standards to, to, to carry that out. But in principle, it ought to be possible because the large particles will have edges of high energy, sorry, low energy, the small particles will have energies of high energy, edges of high energy, and a distribution of particle size will have a smeared out edge. So rather than interpreting the average edge energy, it might be possible to actually go back and fit the edges so as to obtain a particle size distribution. Um, that 
will take very uh, careful measurement of spectroscopy. Um, and I don't know when such a thing like you might come up, but it would be very interesting to do, particularly because you could apply that under reaction conditions. Again, spectroscopy uses uh, visible or UV photons. You can make cell windows out of quartz that um, allow them to pass through, and there's cubicle cell designs from a company called Eric that allow you to heat the cool sample under a new controlled atmosphere, which would therefore permit you to do something like the experiment that George Holston was doing, but now using a different range of the, um, the spectrum and uh, getting out of different information. The, the um, use of this technique in, in uh, for, for measuring part properties of catalysts in situ is in the tradition that C.O. Bennett has encouraged us all to use, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Questions? Ted? No. Um, I didn't quite understand your example on the uh, methanol oxidation of the uh, You expect a large effect to occur when the band gap energies are close between the supporting material and the support, and something magical. Uh, I don't understand why that would occur first. And also, from the data, it seems like there's a catastrophic decrease in the rate rather mm -hmm. than an increase. Yeah. Um, I wasn't willing to predict the sign of the direction of this uh, change, just that something ought to occur. I also thought there ought to have been an increase, but there wasn't. So now I've got to find a way to, to accommodate a decrease. But the idea is that if you are, this, these are all redox reactions, the electrons which are taken out of the organic, eventually go over to oxygen, um, possibly at the same site, possibly someplace else. In any case, you are obliged to deal with that, those electrons that come in. And it would be nice if you could find some place to at least temporarily store them. Um, and I'm suggesting that if you match well band gap of the support with the, with the transition energy of the, of the species doing the electron transfer, then something might happen. I would have thought a higher efficiency and therefore a faster rate, and I don't know why this doesn't happen. Um, well, was the activation energy for all those? All exactly the same. same. All exactly the same. It's all in terms of the factor. So I, I, I agree. I was disappointed not to see an increase in the rate, um, but at least from for, for motivating a concept, um, change was nice to see. Yeah, well, I was intrigued with the new approach you've given us. But early on in the talk, you had this table where you made a comparison. You used Harrison's approximation. Okay. Could you that up? Mm -hmm. exciting electron from one band to the, to the next band up. Uh, he says that, that the transition probability for that uh, transition ought to be on the order of h bar over a, the lattice distance squared. Um, and that has only to do with the fact that if you know the, the distance between the wave functions, that's the a, and if you know something about the, the um, puffiness of the orbitals, then you can measure and estimate what is the transition probability from going from one to the other. Um, however, if the orbitals are very well localized, then this transition, this, this correlation breaks down. And the reason it breaks down is because you've got this little thing over here and this little thing over here, and don't really move by that very well at all. They're not puffy, they're not, they're not um, uh, near to each other. And in, in that case, you've got, uh, this correlation is not going to work. Right, when will that occur? 
that one of the uh, orbitals so far apart or so localized that they're not going to overlap well, well that exactly describes an insulator. And an insulator's got a large band gap. So you'd expect Harrison's correlation to fail as the band gap energy gets bigger. And that's what I'm showing on this table, which is that the small band gap energy, something less than a volt, have this correlation works very well. The large band gap uh, materials, um, more like insulators, doesn't work well. So if you want to use it, by all means do so, but you but you're obliged to, to use this kind of correlation if you want to get accurate numbers, um, only for these small band gap materials. Things like ruthenium sulfide, things uh, like uh, um, actually the inbox is a little bit it's sort of on the board. about this in the grossest sense, the band cap can be thought of as, as, as just the particle in the box. And, and, and if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a composition of, of one material, then the particle size can define the box, as it were. Or if you change the composition, as you do in your heteropolyanions, the box is smaller because even though there's a next nearest neighbor, it is a, a, has a different uh, electronic structure. It doesn't couple, and so it's, you can get out this adjacency. But nothing in there is there any local symmetry and one would have thought that that uh, the effective box size might also be affected by that and in fact re-looking at the same data you're looking at i sort of see a big break between octahedral and tetrahedral ones and yet i know that up in your correlation certainly from molybdenum there you've got things that are octahedral and tetrahedral and in fact for your vanadium one you've got things that are octahedral and tetrahedral and that I have to confess, you have a good empirical correlation between mixed nearest neighbor and edge energy, which ignores local symmetry. Well, what do you, what, what's your comment? I mean, why, why is that? that yeah. I, I don't think that should be so. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you want to look at the correlation more carefully, it is the case that the smaller particles are all tetrahedral and the smaller clusters are all at higher energy. I agree. There's no question about it. Um, and in fact, you find exactly the same thing from crystal field theory. Great. Um, the only, the, the surprising thing is that you don't have to have two lines to these data, one from the tetrahedral complexes, one from the octahedral complexes, you need only one line. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Um, but I'll guess. I think the answer is that you actually are not measuring with this more physics-like technique information that is localized. I think you're actually measuring about the delocalization of electrons. And yes, there ought to be some uh, subtlety of, of how delocalized it is. The box size you're saying is defined by the ligands. And I'm saying, no, the box size isn't defined by the ligands. The box size is actually, if you look at the nature of the next highest orbital, an unoccupied orbital for all of these oxides here is, is ligand oxygen, sorry, metal oxygen antibond. It is a reason it goes, uh, it's metal, D orbital antibond to oxygen P orbital, metal D orbital to oxygen P orbital. That's a rather um, delocalized orbital. It's not as localized as the highest occupied orbital, which is just lone pair on the oxygen. And I think that no matter whether it's octahedral or tetrahedral coordination, the next highest, the, highest, the lowest unoccupied orbital has that character. And I think that this technique is probing something about how easy it is to take an electron from this, this very localized level to the next un delocalized level. And again, both tetrahedral and octahedral complexes have the same kind of symmetry um, in, the, in the lowest unoccupied level. That's the only thing that just occurred. Thanks, Tom. Uh, 